Doctors with disabilities exist in small but measurable numbers. How did they navigate their journey? What were the challenges? What are the benefits to patients and to their peers? What can we learn from their experiences? My name is Lisa Meeks, and I'm thrilled to bring you the Docs with Disabilities podcast. Join me as I interview docs, nurses, psychologists, OTs, PTs, pharmacists, dentists, and the list goes on. I'll also be interviewing the researchers and policymakers that ensure medicine remains an equal opportunity profession. Welcome to today's episode, where I'm excited to be joined by my colleagues from CU Anschutz School of Dental Medicine to discuss their recent case study published in the Journal of Dental Education titled Innovation for Disability Inclusion in Dentistry. Today, I'm joined by Drs. Sophia Khan, Eric Medavia, and Derek Biznet, a proud graduate of the program. As the dental profession continues to evolve and diversify, it's becoming increasingly important to discuss disability inclusion. In this episode, we'll review their insightful case study, highlighting the innovative strategies they've developed to integrate disability inclusion into dental training. We'll also discuss the valuable lessons they've learned and offer recommendations for other dental schools looking to implement similar initiatives. To kick things off, we'll begin with an introduction from our guests. Hi, I'm Dr. Sophia Khan. I'm an associate professor at CU Anschutz School of Dental Medicine. I'm the director of student affairs there. I'm also one of the clinical course directors. I work closely with Dr. Metter Via. I'm Dr. Derek Biznet. I graduated from CU Anschutz School of Dental Medicine in 2020. I'm currently an oral maxillofacial radiologist. Hi, I'm Rick Medavia. I'm the Dean of Student Affairs and Admissions at the University of Colorado School of Dental Medicine. I am also a general dentist and I teach didactic and clinical coursework for the dental students and I work with Sophia very closely. Wonderful. We're going to start by centering this discussion on the dentist with the disability, on you, Derek. Tell us about your experience applying to dental school. Were you met with any resistance either by society, your friends, your colleagues, or by dental schools? I wouldn't say that I was met with any resistance. I knew I wanted to go into healthcare, and so I actually shadowed a lot of, of different healthcare professions and found right away some that I knew wouldn't work, even if I was interested in them, and then saw some that would work very well that I wasn't as interested in. And dentistry kind of was a good one for me because it, it met me in the middle, if you will. There were things I was really, really interested in, but then there were also some pretty obvious barriers that I was going to have to overcome, but those barriers didn't seem insurmountable. I got my CNA, for example, in high school, and I can't really lift someone in and out of a bed. So that was a little bit of a tricky part, for example, where the barriers in dentistry I saw as a little less of an obstacle. So I really wouldn't say that I met any resistance I do remember very specifically in my statement, if you will, that I submitted to all the dental schools. I did not put that I was in a wheelchair. I did not put that I had a physical disability. If you read, it was pretty obvious that I did. I had a pretty extensive wheelchair basketball career before dental school, and I talked about that in my personal statement. But I don't think I ever outright came and told anyone, hey, I have a physical disability. Hey, I use a wheelchair. So honestly, when I went and interviewed at a lot of these schools, I don't know if all of them knew what they were getting themselves into. And that was evident at some schools when I showed up, it was a little bit of a moment. In other schools, it was pretty obvious that they were prepared. I didn't really receive any pushback or, I guess, steering in a different direction from any dentist or any school that I ever met. That's fantastic. And actually surprising to me, given the rampant ableism that kind of exists across health professions programs, I think that gives me pause about my own assumptions that it would just be difficult. And maybe I need to check myself a little bit, but it, it gives me a lot of hope that your experience wasn't a poor one. And Sophia and Rick, on the other side of that, when you were reading this application from the LeBron James of wheelchair basketball, did you have any reservations or did you think, oh, this is possible? Where were you on that scale of this is impossible to this is possible. 
I can probably speak to at least the initial assessment from when we start to decide to give interviews out or not. The remarks looking back on his application were, you know, this is an incredible story. So I think that the, the basis for him being offered an interview was really his recounting of how he got to where he was. And I think we wanted to learn more. So I think the discussion about how we were going to facilitate his education happened a little bit later. But initially, it sounds like a great person we want to get to know on a personal level. And I think that's where we left it. And I think at that time we we're doing in-person interviews because this is prior to COVID. So I think that was just kind of the way we proceeded. This is somebody that sounds like that would fit into the mold and the culture of our school. And we wanted to know more. I remember the discussions we had in our admissions committee. It was more talked about, about how wonderful and intelligent he was and how remarkable he was and that we needed to have him just because of the person he was going to be and the contribution he could make to our profession. And we're like, the wheelchair thing, we'll figure it out. The very um, positive reaction from everyone. Yeah. The best case scenarios are when schools say, we don't know and kind of own that, but we will figure it out, right? This can't be insurmountable. So we might have some failures or some attempts at things and we may have to navigate it a little bit, but we'll figure it all out. When you interviewed, what were your thoughts, your initial thoughts? Well, so this is going to kind of, it's funny, as you have interviewed, obviously, lots of people with disabilities, some of the things that we just look for in the world is probably a little bit different than what the average person looks for. So when I applied to dental school, I don't even know if Dr. Medivy and Dr. Khan know this. I had no idea, really, what the reception would be. I had, I guess, in my eyes, a few things going against me. One, I didn't have a home state dental school. I'm from North Dakota. That's where I was a, a resident of at the time. So there was no North Dakota dental school where they accept a certain amount of in-state students. So I was out of state everywhere. So I applied to 15 schools and I got 14 interviews and I went to 14 interviews. Why not? So the first thing that I always would notice is the age of the building. And, and that might seem a little weird and a little odd, but I could pretty much tell you on the get-go if I was going to be able to use a bathroom, if I was going to have to go to like a specific floor to use a restroom, for example, if there were going to be doors that were too tight, too skinny, just based on the age of the building, not too much to do with this podcast, but it's the same thing when I was looking for a house in Minneapolis, right? I mean, anything built earlier than 1980, the doors are about two to three inches skinnier by default. So there are a lot of things... I guess I would say architecturally, as odd as that might sound, that I looked at right away. And one of the reasons that I was drawn to see you was the, the newness of the campus and the building. I mean, it was a brand new, still is fairly, I mean, relatively brand new campus, brand new building. And so I knew some of those concerns right away wouldn't even be concerns. And I guess I could move past them and focus on other things. Where we're with some places I interviewed, as much as I liked everything, before I could even worry about the hurdles of dentistry, I had to worry about the hurdles of the building. Did you feel a sense of being welcomed and that your disability wouldn't be kind of the primary driver of your interaction, that they really valued you as a learner? Yeah, I thought at most of my interviews, people were able to look past the, the wheelchair in my perspective, if you will. There wasn't, I guess, a lot of pause or concern about how we would go about certain things. I and mean, it was more focused, especially at CU, about, okay, if we do have an obstacle, how can we overcome that together rather than, I guess, see it as a barrier to admittance, if you will. That's amazing. And Sophia and Rick, did either one of you have an experience with a learner with a disability in any of your previous or current capacities? Did you have family or friends with disabilities? What made this such a non-issue for you? I grew up with a friend who had cerebral palsy, and he is somebody that was never limited by his physical abilities. He ran on the track team, and he swam, and obviously he wasn't as fast as some, but his attitude about not being able to participate in those types of activities always kind of inspired me to say, you know, he knows that he can contribute in a way to the team that others can't. And one thing I'd say about Derek in his interview is he was very forthright about his research and what he perceived to be possible barriers for him during his education. One of the interviews he had is somebody who was very tough by nature. And Derek basically said, I've done my research. I understand that this is what I'm going to have to do. And this is somebody who would continually ask a lot of questions if he had any doubts. And just talking to him before we started and rereading what he wrote in his comments, 
as soon as Derek presented his history of research, that was it. I mean, that part of the discussion was over and it was really on to whether or not he thought that he was going to be a good fit for the school. And certainly that's not the way that many people would probably handle this type of situation. That's the type of person Derek is. Yeah. In my previous institution, I worked at NYU and I was a faculty and we had a student come in who had an auditory disorder and he would have a computer where he would be able to type what he was trying to say or articulate to everybody. And he used to have change between two assistants or audiology techs that would actually help make sure the equipment was monitored and we were able to understand him well. So, you know, what came to my mind at first, you know, the reaction is, how is he going to do this? But then you look at the resilience and the discipline. And that resilience is, I think, what inspires you more to teach and have that renewal faith in your profession and your career to want to teach people that want to learn, that have overcome obstacles. So you look at this as, I want to spend more time with this person, actually. So you decide to write up this case study and... It goes into this section of the Journal of Dental Education called Advancing Through Innovation. And many people would assume that having a wheelchair user in dentistry school would require a ton of innovation. And what we find out as the reader, as we're going through the article, is that there were very little accommodations that were necessary. So let's dive into the paper. In that, you suggest that using a different lab with lowered equipment might be helpful. How did you envision implementing this in dental education and in what ways might this be more universally accessible to all learners? I don't know how much all the listeners will know about dental school and dentistry, but you really kind of have, I guess, two labs. You have your skill lab, your technique lab, which is not really picking up a drill, if you will, dentures, impressions, all the things the first years love, waxing teeth, etc. And then you have your simulation lab, which is a little bit more clinical experience, crowns, fillings, etc. So the, the simulation lab is pretty set in terms of it's, it's going to be like a patient interaction. And I don't find that we needed too many accommodations in there. There are some things we need to do differently just to be successful, but I, I guess I really wouldn't consider those accommodations. In terms of the, the technique lab, really, I think it would be more accessible for everyone if, if labs were just lower. Yeah, I'm a bias towards lower everything. <laughs> I wish my kitchen counters were lower so I could use a cutting board not on my lap, but it's just the, the reality of the world. But I do think having labs that are lower in general, just as a, a generic, if you will, it just opens up that door for anyone that may or may not be able to use that. feel very lucky to have gone to school with a, a dear friend of mine that got pregnant twice in dental school. And even for her, right? Not something we would think about. I know that sometimes those technique labs were tricky for her to sit on those high stools. So I guess that's just kind of my general comment. Make stuff lower. Yeah. I mean, in medicine, we see this too. In many cases, it has to be quote unquote, an accommodation. I'm with you. I don't see this really as an accommodation, but to lower the equipment so that someone of small stature or someone that's a wheelchair user can use it. But when the equipment is lowered, everyone can still use it, right? And it makes it available for more people. We're not denying anyone the ability to use it in any capacity whatsoever. So it just seems to make sense that if you build out spaces to be universally accessible, that everyone will benefit in some way. And that actually brings me to another thing in the paper that you talked about, which was if you could have, and and in this case, you did by default, but it wasn't that they were built this way, but you chose wider bays, right, to see patients in. And while this was helpful for your wheelchair and to have enough space, how easy might this be to do in dental education of writ large, and what would some of the benefits be to widening the bays that might be important for all students? I think the wider bay would be helpful in general, not only to a student that was in a wheelchair, but any of our other patients that are coming in when walkers or wheelchair assistants. I think space does help everyone facilitate that. And some of our patients that do come in in wheelchairs are assisted by a family member, a friend, or a home health aide. So I think just giving that room in general is helpful. So I do agree that some of our spaces were a little narrower than others and other clinic floors were a little wider. The downfall of it was for Derek, I I believe, was depending on those wider bays, it might mean 
certain faculty were assigned to those sections. So he may not be doing continuing care with a certain faculty. So he may have to start over or just be resorted to someone who's picking up a case in the middle instead of having that continuum with him and the patient. So I think that may have limited his access a little bit. So we, and you know, Dr. Maravillo, feel free to chime in at any point, but we did discuss assigning me a singular bay. I mean, at the mm-hmm. very beginning, and for those, you know, have never been at least at CU's dental school, the faculty are assigned to certain chairs and they don't really move the mm-hmm. students and their patients, if you will, will, will move to those faculties and those chairs when those procedures are needed. So to put me in a single chair would make that difficult because I would be with whatever faculty was there, whether that was for a denture, a filling, a crown, a root canal, et cetera, even if they weren't necessarily the, the right person to cover that. So that in itself created a whole different barrier, if you will, assigning me to just one wide bay. But Really, it was something, it's it's funny, I, I say I learned it all as like we were going out of school, kind of what bays would work best, and it was just trial and error. But I don't think there's many dentists that would disagree. They would love a wider bay. Sophia, you bring up such a good point about thinking about the patients as well. It's not just the providers, but it could be parents that are with a child with disabilities who need someone to be there or someone who is assisting a, an individual with a physical disability or an older relative or friend that wants to stay in that bay. But also I was thinking about how we're leaning into interprofessional education and having other students in that space to kind of watch and learn from one another. And if you want to have that be a learning scenario, you're going to need to have space for the learners to be there, right? So that was kind of the benefit that I was thinking of. Rick, were there any benefits that you thought of outside of what we were talking about? Yeah. And like most things, it all depends on who's sitting in your chair and what they need. For some people that have anxiety, more space is better so they don't feel like they're claustrophobic and people aren't surrounding them during their treatment, while others find that kind of compact setting comforting. So, you know, having, I think, at least the flexibility to have more open spaces allows, at least for those patients that would rather have space, is certainly beneficial with the ability to close down that space for those that would rather have a confined, safer area, if you will. And I think even in a lab educational setting, when we're talking about the simulation lab or the technique lab, when you have a group of people who are under stress, and some of them do deal with some anxiety, having other students basically kind of in your area with a lot of equipment getting up getting out and maybe inadvertently buffing you. Those are all things that can really take you beyond maybe a a point where you can cope well with that. And that may affect your academic performance. Unfortunately, the reality is, is we don't have the luxury of space a lot of times because classes expand. When Sophia and I first started, we only had 53 students and we expanded to 80 and we didn't have any expansion of that space. So we definitely did have people compressed into a sardine can Uh, to some degree, and really people running high anxiety emotions during, you know, a high value test, you know, that led to maybe some negative interactions for the, for the students and maybe affected their overall wellness. Yeah. Great point. Derek, you brought up this idea of a trial run a couple of times now, maybe not using those specific terms, but when you first started telling us about your experience. You talked about going on all 14 interviews and the critical nature of going on those 14 interviews to really see the physical space. And so I'm going to, I'm going to say that's a little bit of a trial run, right? But also in doing a trial run to figure out how you were going to best navigate the clinical space. In the paper, you specifically call out a trial run as being really, really important before dental school, before even starting it, to be able to know what you're getting into. Can you give our audience a few more examples? I know you touched on this a little in your intro, but just a few other examples of things that were paramount to you being able to be successful at CU. Yeah. So every, I mean, everyone that applies to dental school has to do shadowing of dentists, hopefully of dentists before they, they apply and get into dental school. And I would say that experience, even before I got to putting any sort of words on an application was the first trial 
run, if you will. I was lucky enough to, to shadow some dentists that were very encouraging and not discouraging. And to be honest with you, if that experience went different, we might not be having this conversation. I tried to shadow many doctors and everyone told me to go do dentistry. And then I got to most dentists and every single one of them said, I love it. And, and we're very encouraging and supportive in finding ways to make the experience good for me. Now, if you've never shadowed a dentist, it might be one of the top five most boring things, in my opinion, because you can't really ever see what they're doing when you're standing over their shoulder and they're working in someone's mouth that doesn't want to open it. So it's it's not always the most exciting, but I, from a day-to-day job standpoint, I was able to see that I would be able to kind of handle the work, if you will, or at least make an accommodation for the work to be successful doing it. So I guess that would be, have been my first trial one before I even got into dental school. So that was one. Another one that Dr. Dan Wilson and I did in Sim Lab week one, um, before I really knew anything about anything, was how I was going to drill with a rheostat, which for those that don't know, is just the foot pedal that the dentist pushed that makes the burr spin. So we experimented with that. And that was a really important trial run. In hindsight, I'm the type of person that I don't, I don't like to bug people. A, if I have a problem, I'm probably going to come to you with a solution before I try to bring you the problem. And two, I've just always been in a place where it's you make it work for the best you can. And and you don't complain and you you move on with life. So in hindsight, the hand reestat maybe would have helped me be a little bit more successful. I don't know. We never really got around to the point of trying it because my attitude at the time was I can make the foot one work. And if I can figure this out, I'll be successful without any sort of accommodation. But again, in hindsight, in old age, as I get older, maybe I was a little too stubborn and should have should have tried that. So I think those are some of the more important, I guess, experiments that I did, to be fully candid, there were things that I overlooked. For example, I've had two lower back surgeries. I did not consider or think about leaning over 20 patients a day for eight hours a day, which is ultimately the reason I started looking in kind of different specialties. I did not consider the time for movement in a wheelchair. Dr. Khan or Dr. Medavia stand up with their patient. They don't have to take their gloves off, wash their hands, get in their chair, move their chair, grab what they need rewash their hands, put their gloves back on, and then hopefully be able to sit down without contaminating their gloves. So moving around during operations or during procedures became a really big puzzle. And I really had to be prepared in that regard. Now, a lot of these might have been addressable in a private practice scenario, but school where you're, where you're on your own really highlighted them, if you will. So even though I did do quite a few trial runs, maybe I didn't do enough, (laughs) but they were all things that, again, as a learner, I think, and I think we touch on this in the paper too, a lot of times I didn't know if I was just learning or if it was a barrier. Drilling on a tooth as crude as it might seem is very difficult and it's a very fine technique and it takes years to, to get really good at. And when you're first starting some, at least for me, right, I didn't know, well, could I be doing this better because of a barrier? Or is it just that I'm new to this skill? So that, I think that was a tricky part. And then I think by the time I was leaving, the, my skills had improved and it was like, okay, this is a barrier versus learning, for example. Yeah, I think that's so common in health professions. It's such a steep learning curve that it's trying to discern whether it's disability related or just part of the natural kind of course of education. I'm glad you brought up the foot pedal because I was actually going to bring it up for our audience who probably thinks about the fact that a dentist is drilling using a foot pedal. Can you tell us how you did that? I would have assumed that you used the hand pedal. I didn't, I don't think Uh I realized that you found a way to use the foot pedal. I have just enough mobility in my right foot to be able to push down on it with my heel. It really kind of depends on your setup, if you will. Some, I guess, are all or nothing. You're either drilling at 100% or you're not, where others, you kind of have a little bit of feathering or control, if you will. And so I would really drill based on sound because I didn't have much sensation of where, how much I was putting the foot pedal down. So I would go off the sound of the burr, which worked surprisingly well for a while. But again, the issue I found with decreased strength in my legs, I already was a little bit unstable. So there were times where I was having used that foot control and put all my weight for balance on my left leg almost. And that created some uneasy moments, if you will, just because I know my own strength limits. And 9 a.m. was probably fine, but time 3.30 rolled around, it was a pretty tired leg for the day, which is, again, something probably most people don't experience or, or think about because that sort of stress throughout the day won't fatigue them but with my decreased function and and muscle mass it is it was quite fatiguing yeah 
May I also add one thing also, I was thinking about the operatory and Derek said something that created a light bulb in my brain was also the way the operatory is set up. So if, you know, if someone is right-handed, but if the materials are located on the far wall on the left side of the operatory, then it's further away from them versus something that's on their same side. So if he had to access the glove or it tore during a procedure, which can happen, changing that glove would be a bigger feat for him having to move to the other side of the wall or the room to get that glove versus if it was on the same side of his dominant side, then it'd be much easier and less time and more efficient for him to do so. And that was one of those we figured out was a barrier towards the end of school and why my procedures were taking like twice as long in certain <laughs> operatories versus other. It was really just at that moment of, oh, hey, it's the operatory setup, not necessarily the skill level where I guess in the first couple years it, or year, if you will, it was more, this could have gone better, but was it the setup or was it just a tough procedure for a third year dental student? You talk in the paper about alternatives and kind of the lessons learned and One of the things that gets brought up a lot, at least in medicine, and I imagine across health professions, is instructional videos for lab where if you were not able to access something due to a disability-related barrier, you could get that information at another time or through another means. And so this is especially helpful with students that have chronic illnesses that might lead to them missing a particular lecture, missing a skills lab, something of that nature. What are your thoughts about being able to create instructional videos for different lab techniques? And do you think this would be effective as a a way of teaching? I'll say from a student perspective as someone, well, I guess I have taught labs too, haven't I now? Yeah, I guess as both a student and someone who's taught some labs, the videos were always helpful for the Saturday, Sundays when I was in on my own trying to set teeth and hating life. I think, and I don't want to speak for other, I guess, professions, dentistry is such a, I almost think of it like an apprenticeship sometimes. There are just some hand skills and some techniques that you're never going to find in a textbook or a video. And so I do think dentistry specifically, I'm going to maybe sound older than I am, but I think in-person instruction is, is really important. But the videos are or nice resources and and all that. I would have missed a lot if I didn't have in-person instruction, I guess I'll say it that way. As a supplement to in-person instruction, uh, absolutely. People with chronic illnesses being able to catch up on lectures and having some sort of guidance for lab procedures based on videos that the instructors have created, I think is a great tool. But as Derek said, being there in person and getting feedback in person, I think is something that you need in dentistry. But I think having those resources available are certainly an important part of a learner's experience. Absolutely. I know some schools that don't have the traditional ways of teaching anatomy are moving to virtual reality. So I'm a little bit of a nerd, actually, and I did research (laughs) on this with my math. Yeah, the hollow lens, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I I have one, because why not? You have a hollow lens? The University of Iowa bought one. And everything was in my name. So for the longest time, I pretty much had one, but I did have to give it back. So I'm an oral maxillofacial radiologist now. So Mm -hmm. my master's degree was 70% anatomy and it was incredible for learning anatomy. I, I learned anatomy through that thing. I don't know if I learned anatomy better through the HoloLens because I had already taken anatomy at CU. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I learned it better because it was more accessible. I could definitely see the holographic structures better than I could with the the real cadavers just based Mm -hmm. on how I'm able to position myself compared to someone who can stand. But I will say that I I really enjoyed, I enjoyed it and I was a big contributor to my, I guess, current knowledge of anatomy. But again, whether that's because it was my second and third anatomy course or whether that was because it was a different modality is hard for me to say. I think for me, anatomy was gray on gray on shades of gray, which made it hard to distinguish certain structures. So the hollow lens for me kind of brought everything to life through color. I don't know if that resonates with you, but it helped me differentiate the structures because of a lot of that vivid color. It also made me terribly deathly 
ill, but I think it's a good learning opportunity. I've taken an interest in the anatomage tables and things of that Mm -hmm. nature to see kind of what the value is there. But, you know, my question is, do you think these alternative mechanisms for learning, especially when it's disability related, or as we're seeing kind of across the country where you're not able to get specimens as readily as you were able to, what do you think are the benefit is to having these alternative ways of learning? And what are the drawbacks? I thought, at least from a disability standpoint, the HoloLens made anatomy accessible in a way that it had not been accessible to me before. With that said, but I do think that there was a very valuable lesson in the actual cadaver experience just in terms of appreciation of what you're doing in your profession in terms of caring for another human. So I do think that the cadaver experience just for for me as a doctor and especially as a young doctor, young pre-doc, if you will, at that time, was a very valuable experience that I wouldn't personally trade, even if I did find the hollow lens, I guess, a more effective tool. I think the utilization of having a cadaver that's accessible virtually really does remove the gray on gray where you don't really have an appreciation for what the the tissue looks like when it's oxygenated or when it's depleted of oxygen. So that gives you a little bit better perspective of what it looks like when it's working as opposed to having the cadaver where everything isn't quite as as well defined and you really are subject to how well your dissection is. And if it's, you know, a bunch of novices doing their own dissection, it's not nearly as nicely laid out for you as if you have a skilled surgeon doing that for you. And I think having the virtual cadaver to to work your way around is very valuable. But for us as dentists, we are very hand-eye coordinated people that want hands-on experience to kind of relate distances and landmarks, probably not only with our brains, but with our eyes and our hands. So we have a, a good tactile appreciation of of where structures are. So I would say certainly the hands-on component is, is very valuable, I think, for us. And Sophia, I don't know if you have anything to add on that. No, I agree with all of that. I think the experience, what Derek and Rick said about having the cadaver is great. There's a certain amount of appreciation for human life and what we do and then how it all integrates is really important, which would lose value on a virtual platform. However, I think And also what to Rick said, it depends which kind of cadaver you had. If you had one, I remember when I had anatomy lab and one of our, I had a very lean person. So it was very easy to find structures. One of my classmates had to get through a lot of fat. So they had a lot of trouble just getting through the first steps because of that. However, I think it should be either you use plastination or the VR models are a great supplement because it also gives people access to how they learn. Some people need a little bit more time, some people less. So it may not be they have a disability, but just accommodating everyone. Because oftentimes those cadaver labs, just to protect them because they were, you know, once a human life and it's a human body, they're usually... You know, certain times you may be able to have access to the labs. They may not be open 24-7. I remember my time, it was not open 24-7. So sometimes having that access on other off times to study and go over it, these plastination bodies or VR would be a good supplement. You know, you're bringing up so many things that are not only important for learners that are disabled. And so I love what you said, Sophia, this is This is helpful for everyone. Everyone has a transition, whether they're going to dental school or medical school or whatever health profession, and their learning may occur at different speeds or in different ways. And so I think in general, the more opportunities people have to engage various forms of instruction, the better. And these alternative instructional platforms can supplement when a disabled person is unable to attend a certain lecture or struggling to get to a lab on a day when they're having a flare. And I think you actually, if you have these resources in place, you're not having to be worried when you accept a student that has a certain disability or needing an accommodation because yes, we already have that. As you were referred to those videos that are uploaded, that's a question we initially got, you know, I'm the accommodations liaison to, on the campus. And that's that was a question initially when we were meeting with that department, 
do you provide the videos ahead of time? I said, yes, they're already provided because we know people learn differently, whether or not they need an accommodation or they have a disability or not. These are always very helpful to have it uploaded before because people process things differently. So if you already have these types of things in place, it's less of a hurdle or a barrier to overcome if a student does require that or a faculty or staff. Well, Ultimately, Derek didn't require a lot of accommodations. You enumerate the accommodations that you used in the paper. You also talk about these lessons learned, things that would have been really, in hindsight, I think pretty easy to implement. But I don't even recall one being a huge cost, right? Certainly they were not unreasonable, but none of them seemed like a heavy lift. I don't know that every dental school could imagine that. I'm heartened by Derek's reporting that, you know, many dental schools were welcoming and I'm not quite sold that every dental school would be like that. Maybe Derek, you just had really good odds in your favor. But I think that knowing that there just weren't that many accommodations gets rid of some of the fear that dental schools may have. And so I'm wondering, Rick and Sophia, particularly if you could talk about the value add that occurred with being inclusive and in that, how you might encourage other schools to think in more depth about disability inclusion and be more open to disability inclusion. I think we were really fortunate to also have Derek. Derek is is special in his own ways because of who he is and the personality that he brings. So I think, as you know, Derek stated earlier, he didn't ask for much because he figured it out and usually offered a solution with the problem. He was like, I already solved it, but this is what I noticed. That's a very unique personality. And we were fortunate to have someone that was willing to work with us too and be very understanding, not at all demanding and extremely pleasant. So a lot of things we probably could have helped him further But because he never brought it up or brought it up six months later, was like, well, it would have been helpful if this was there. We're like, why didn't you tell us, Derek? We would have totally helped you. I got it. He didn't ask for much, but we could have done more for him to make things easier on him. Just bringing supplies to him, you know, when he was talking about gloves and things like that. If we had made that available at his operatory or at least a mobile cart that he could have taken with him, that would have saved him. I don't know how much time during patient procedures probably would have taken a little stress off him and maybe his progress for developing his skills would have been an easier road for him. In terms of accepting people in an inclusive manner, we're really formulating the the future of our professions. And I think decisions should be based on that person and what they're going to bring to the field, whether it be dentistry or medicine, and embrace that person as the colleague that is going to advance our respective professions. And when you have the problems that come up, because sometimes you don't know what you don't know, just be prepared to deal with them and, and invest in in the educational experience of people that do have disabilities and accommodations, but all of your students. Because oftentimes, because Derek uses a wheelchair, it's very easy to see what challenges he may have. But those that don't have anything that's discernible from just looking at them or talking to them doesn't mean that you're not going to have to provide reasonable accommodations for them sometimes throughout their educational experience. So I would embrace that fact that everybody that we pick has to fulfill our technical standards. And we don't always have the ability to identify them at the beginning, but understand that you will have to provide reasonable accommodation somewhere down the line. So if they have something that you find of value on a personal level, that they're going to care for their patients and be respectful, that's what you you embrace and then work out the details later. Yeah. And I was just going to say, so I know if you sit down and write write down a list of of everything that was changed. It doesn't look huge or drastic, but the support I got from CU on some of the things that are harder to to write down and fix. For example, as as Dr. Medavia said, it's pretty obvious when you see me, I have a disability. It's not hidden in any way, shape or form. And that scared patients, to be very honest with you. That was a barrier that there really is not an answer for always. One, patients are a little are usually a little bit nervous to be getting care at a dental school to begin with. And then two, your provider comes out in a wheelchair, depending on your preconceived notions of what that means. That was a barrier that there really is no solution that we can write down 
an answer to. So they were supportive in all those ways, even though they're not necessarily always listed. And I will tell you, Derek, something that a a student taught me. I said, and this was a student that was a wheelchair user, a medical student. I said, did you ever have any pushback? And we were talking in particular about an OBGYN clerkship. So same kind of nervousness, I guess you could say, is in women's health. It's not a super comfortable type of appointment. And we were talking about that. And she said, you know, I don't think we give patients enough credit for not being ableist. I think many people probably were not concerned with my wheelchair, but may have been very concerned about the fact that I was a first year or second year medical student. I'd like to thank my guests, Drs. Sophia Khan, Eric Medavia, and Derek Biznet, for joining me today and for their work to bring disability inclusion to dental education. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your colleagues. This podcast is a creation of the Docs with Disabilities Initiative, supported in part from the University of Michigan Medical School Department of Family Medicine M Disability Initiative the Stanford Medicine Alliance for Disability Inclusion and Equity, and the Ford Foundation. The views expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent those of the hosts, their respective institutions, or the sponsors. This episode is released under a Creative Commons Attribution, non-commercial, non-derivative license. This episode was produced by me, Lisa Meeks. Thank you so much for listening, and don't forget to subscribe.